morning, GFC. That was really anemic. Only the second day of class, and we're really already that sleepy. Let's try it again. Good morning, GFC. Uh, we woke up a little bit there. It's good to see you in the Lord's house. I want to share a word of scripture this morning from Hebrews chapter 1. We have gathered together here uh, as uh, Chris Stratton uh, shared with you uh, yesterday as we are celebrating the Epiphany season, thinking uh, in the lines of, of this emphasis upon Christ as King and preparing our hearts to really receive Him as and to take His lives. I want to share this passage from Hebrews chapter 1, one of the great Christological passages of the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Who, who did he have in mind? Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, the minor prophets, Jeremiah. He spoke through his men, through the prophets. But he says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, and he quotes the book of Psalms, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. The writer of Hebrews wants us to be well aware that this king that the prophets spoke of is none other than the Son of God, Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And it is to him that we give our worship and our praise this morning. Amen? Stand to your feet. Let's sing together.
Father God, you are able this morning to do far exceedingly and more abundantly than all we can ask or think. And we give you praise and glory in this place today. God, I ask you to take the remainder. that is above every name, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 We're going to come back a little bit later on um, this morning to have a time of prayer together and also come back with a little bit more music. And so uh, there is more to come um, as, we, uh, as we look forward to the conclusion of our time together. But we've got some things to do, things to share. Things to dialogue about as we engage our time together this morning. How many of you enjoyed Algernon yesterday? Awesome. Now, Algernon and I have been talking about this first week for a long time now as we've prayed and talked and, and planned together as to what it is that we're going to explore. Um, really felt strongly that uh, Algernon was to bring a message that at the beginning of this new year would focus us on really what... God is inviting us into, and that is a full-blown relationship, one that's intimate, and if we're going to experience that intimacy of relationship, it's something that's going to require that we pursue it, all right, pursue it, and so we've got to dial in on that call, we've got to dial in on that opportunity, and are you serious? Are you serious? Is that you? Excuse me. All right. Hold on just a minute. This, this is important. Hey, Chris. What's up, man? Super Bowl 54. You ready? I, I'm ready for Super Bowl 54. Yeah, I am. Yeah. That's exciting, man. This is important. I've been looking forward to it for a whole year. Yeah. The family is coming. Yep, yep. Buffalo dip? Okay. Man, this is important. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. Man, I can't wait. It's the highlight of my whole, whole, whole year. And quite frankly, your call's the highlight of my morning. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thanks. All right, good. Let me, I know. Sorry about that. Let me put my, my, let me put that on silent as we're, where were we talking? We're talking about Algernon, right? Intimacy with God, right? Pursuing an intimate relationship with God, right? Wait just a minute. I had it on silent, but now it's buzzing my leg. Wait a minute, I got a text here. Um, it's important. Let me take this just for a minute. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, Chris. I, I did say Buffalo Dip. Okay. All right, good. Yeah, Buffalo. No, Buffalo. Yeah, Buffalo sauce. Yes, Buffalo. Yeah, that's it right there. Okay, dude. Great. Yeah, yeah. All right, good deal. All right, good. Yeah. Let me, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just turn this off. I don't know. Maybe it's not all that appropriate this morning. You know, as we're working with this, uh, yeah, a little bit of an object lesson this morning, right? Uh, this idea of how our world has truly changed since I was your age. Um, I know this might be hard for you to believe, but when I was in your place, there, there were no cell phones. Can you imagine life without cell phones? There were none of those kinds of things. Now, there were plenty of other things to distract us. There were plenty of other kinds of things that we could spend our time doing. But this really wasn't one of them. Uh, let me tell you one of, the, one of the things that we're seeing as it relates to this. You know, typically when there are in the distraction like this, our, our world is out in front of us. Oftentimes, this is the world that I grew up with. This has changed things in many kinds of ways. What went from this world has now gone to this world. This is where I spend a lot of my time. You know, there's a reason they call this an iPhone. Do you know that? It's because it's centered around me. It's, it's, it's about me. 
I mean, here right here, I can stay here as long as I want. And as I stay here as long as I want, this thing tells me what to read each day. It gives me a way to have 24-7 access to people. And by the way, it gives people 24 access to me. Sometimes it even wakes me up at 3 a.m. in order to answer a text. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That, that my world has gone from this to this. And let me tell you what I'm experiencing just in my own life. It, it actually is having implications for my ability to be present with people. All right. Whether you like the illustration or not, yeah, we're here doing something important this morning, but I took time out to do something else, right? Because it was important. I had to get my Super Bowl plans in place, right? Uh, I even had to answer that text because Chris didn't know that I was actually talking about Buffalo Dip. He thought I was talking about something else. So it was important. I had to take a time out in order, all right, to deal with that which was most important in this moment. One of the things that we're finding is, we're having trouble as a society today actually being present with other people. Some of us don't even know really how to do it anymore. Some of you are in the midst of this illustration and you're still right here. I'm looking at you right now. You're still right here. Not only is it making it impossible for us to learn how to actually be present with each other, but I believe that this iPhone is also taking to a place where we have a hard time being present just with ourselves in quiet, where we don't need stimulation, where we don't need to be told what to read. We don't need to be told who to answer. Uh, we, 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 don't, we don't need to be engaged all of the time. We don't know how to be present with ourselves. And you know what? I think one of the places that we're seeing this in, take, take shape in, in some significant ways is we're, we, we don't really know what it means to be present to God anymore. Now, I want to share this with you. The kinds of things that Algernon was talking about yesterday, absolutely central. But there is no intimacy with God. No intimacy with God unless we are nurturing a life where we are present to God, where we're present to ourselves and where we're present to one another. Now, I don't think we need to throw the cell phones away, but we need to reprioritize. We do need to develop other practices in our lives that enable us, while we get the good out of a cell phone, to make sure that we're still nurturing the more important things in life presence and how to be present with others and with God. Let me kind of tell you how this, uh, how this takes shape. It's not really a funny story, okay, but maybe four years ago or so, I hadn't been here very long, and uh, I was working with a student. Right, the student was coming to my office and talking to me about their life, and um, at the heart of this conversation was something like this. You know what? I just don't know what God's up to in my life. You know, I used, I used to have a pretty good sense of that, but I don't know what God is doing. And so we just kind of unpack that. And I ask, like I typically do in scenarios like this, well, well, tell me a little bit about your story. Tell me a little bit about what's going on in your life so that we can kind of narrow down really what it is that you're experiencing. And as we talked about that, uh, that, that issue, uh, it became clear that... Uh, Really one of the reasons that this person was not experiencing the presence of God is because this person actually wasn't nurturing any time with God. This person was talking to me over and over about how busy their life was, how they had to do this and how they had to do that, and how they had to spend time with these people and how they had to spend time with these people, how they had to do this. On and on, the busyness of life. I remember getting at the end of one of those conversations and I said something like this, well, you know what? You may not be experiencing God because you don't have any time to experience Him. It was interesting. A couple of days later, after that final conversation, um, we were here in community worship. And there was a speaker that day that was, uh, yeah, riveting, just like Algernon yesterday. I mean, everybody was dialed in. And it was at a particular place in the message where the speaker was really calling us as a community to a deeper kind of commitment to the Lord. And as I was standing right back here, uh, I was being drawn into this invitation, uh, just pulled in. I felt like I was right here at the front of the stage. All right. 
the, the message and the invitation was, was that profound and it was, it was that poignant in the moment. I remember just for a moment taking my eyes off of the speaker to see something that caught my eye right over here, kind of where Justin is sitting right here. I remember it to be. So I was here, I was looking here, and in that moment I saw the student that I'd been talking with. And here in the midst of this impassioned plea about going into greater depth and intimacy with, with, with Jesus, the student was sitting on a computer. I couldn't tell what that student was doing, but I can tell you that that student was totally engrossed. And I looked up here and looked at what was going on. I looked out here and saw what was going on. I looked back over here and I said, wow, how can we be in, in the presence of God? That the presence of God was so thick you could have cut it with a knife. How could we be in a context where this person was speaking the very word of God into our lives and calling us to respond? But this person had tuned out. Now, I don't want to point the finger today because you know what? I've tuned out a lot in my life as well. But if we can kind of pull all this together and just talk about it together. If we're going to gain and, and, and pursue this kind of intimacy that Algernon talked about yesterday, it means that we're going to have to get serious in creating the conditions in our lives where we can listen and we can be present with ourselves, with each other, and especially with God so that we can actually begin to, to gain the eyesight to see how he's at work, to actually learn the, the sound of his silent voice so that we can begin to hear what he's saying, so that we can begin to connect what we're hearing and what we're seeing and actually joining the work that he's doing all the time in our lives. But, but we don't know it because we're tuned out. Let me just say this morning, my prayer, Algernon's prayer, our prayer as we go throughout this semester is that this would be a semester where we collectively as a group begin to tune in. Because let me tell you something about God as we learn it through Scripture and as I've learned about it as I've walked with Him for 35 years. God is not going to force me to tune in. God's not going to compete with other kinds of commitments and things in our lives. He's inviting us into a full-blown intimate relationship, but He's not going to force it on us. And if we're going to live into it, it's going to require that we pursue it. It's going to require that we nurture it. It's going to require that we give ourselves to it. When I and that student got back together about a week later, I talked to that student about what I saw. And I said, you know what? You're praying all the time for God to show up in your life. And God is showing up all over your life. God's just waiting for you to show up. God's just waiting for us to show up. And when we begin to show up, God wants to lead us into a kind of intimate relationship that we dream about, that, that, that we long for, that is enabling us to become the very people that He's designed us to become and to live in the kind of intimate relationship with Him that He so desires and truly is the longing of a heart, even if we don't know it. But it's going to require us to show up if we're going to experience it. You know, our passage for this morning actually bears witness to this. It comes out of Matthew chapter 2. We talked yesterday about epiphany, right? This, this uh, season, not really a season, but this time in the life of the church year where we celebrate the fact that God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ to the world. And it's a message both to his people and it's a message also to all of the Gentile world. This is a time when we celebrate that revelation, that epiphany that has Christ at its center. I want you to listen to the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 2. And I want you to begin to listen in a way that you pick up a central contrast that's going on here. Okay? A central contrast that's going on here when it comes to the way the people of God, the people of Israel in this chapter respond 
to what God is doing anew and afresh in Christ over and against how the pagans respond. Listen. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Now when King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where this Messiah would be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it's been written by the prophet, O oh, you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. When you found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. Yeah, right. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went to the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, because Herod was going to try to stamp out this new little child in the world, they left for their own country by another road. Back at the end of last semester, as I was preparing for this morning, and as I was reading this text that we've read this morning, I was struck by the fact of how the people of God, God's very people, Israel, responded to the coming of God into the world, especially as the way Matthew begins to contrast that with the way the pagans respond. This is one of those situations where uh, it's the people of God who are going to get schooled. <laughs> the pagans, are, the ones that don't have the Word of God, are the ones who are going to come to terms with what the Word of God says about this new king and come to actually pay him homage. The very people who had the Word of God, who should have seen what was coming, these very people responded very differently to the pagans. And it's the pagans in this second chapter that exemplify what a proper response to this king looks like. Let's start with the people of God. They were indifferent to what God was doing in the world. God was bringing about His promises to this very people. Bringing all the promises to bear and bringing them to fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And they weren't even paying attention. And even when it was brought to their attention, notice how they responded. Not with joy, not even with diligent searching, but with fear. You know why? Because they had a different idea of what it meant to look like or what it meant to be Israel. They had their own agenda for who they were called to be as the people of God. If there was another king that was on the rise, that actually was trouble because it meant that their kingdom building was about to come to an end. They were afraid, the text tells us. And then, it was so threatening of a reality, the people of God responded in another way. This needs to be taken care of. We can't allow this new king to keep us from becoming the people that we believe God wants us to be and become in the world. And so they go to stamp out the life of this new king. But then we hear about these magi, right? These pagans, these astrologers from the east who actually begin to exemplify what it looks like to truly come before this new king. How are they different? Well, first of all, they're paying attention. Yes, it arises out of looking and trying to read the stars, but they're paying attention. There were also people who would have been 
understanding of all the different ancient documents because they looked at those things. They tried to line them up with the stars so that they could get a sense for what God was doing in the world. They were paying attention. Not only that, but notice how they were intentional to actually seek. They were actually intentional to seek after this king. They left where they were. They traveled. They sought out where this king was. I'm sure that there were different twists and turns to their journey, but they stayed the course because they didn't want to miss out on the king. And then when they got there, when they got there, how did they respond to this king? The text says they paid him homage. Basically, they knelt down, they brought him gifts, and they worshiped at the feet of this king. Let me just take a few moments, if you will, to flesh out those three responses. And let me say it this way, that if we're going to develop this kind of intimacy that we talked about yesterday and that we continue to talk about today, then you may want to write these things down. If we're going to engage and experience this intimacy, it's going to require something of us. It's going to require us to begin to pay attention to how God is at work in our lives. How God is at work in our lives. I heard a story one time. It was a story about a friend. She uh, had just become a grandmother. And uh, her little granddaughter was coming over to visit one day. Now, my friend was a, a speaker. Okay, Spoke at lots of different kinds of things. So she always was working on a message. And this particular day, she was preparing for a major conference coming through town, and she was a keynote. And so she was a little preoccupied. So as she was engaging her little granddaughter, who she loved dearly, she was also thinking, she was also writing. And you know how those kinds of things go. You know when you're in the presence of someone who's glad you're there, but is a little busy, right? It's like, Grandma, did you see it? Oh, yes, honey, that's so cute. Never looked up, of course. Grandma, Grandma, have you ever heard this story? Oh, yeah, that's a great story. You tell it. Have you ever been in those kinds of situations? The little girl finally got an understanding of what was happening. So the little girl left her little play area. She walked over to where her grandma was sitting. And she tapped her grandma on the knees and said, Grandma, you're not listening. Oh, yes, honey, I'm listening to you. I've heard every word. I've responded to everything you've asked me. No, Grammy, you're not listening to me. Oh, yes, I am, honey. Yes, I am. The little girl climbed up into her lap, took her papers and put them down. She reached up to her grandmother and grabbed her face and said, No, Grandma, you're not listening to me. I want you to listen to me with your eyes. Sometimes I think that's what God is calling us to do as He's calling us into this intimate space where we learn what it looks like to be present with Him. He's inviting us to listen with our eyes, to, to be attentive to how He's working in our lives so that we can begin to give ourselves to His work in our lives. You know, I think sometimes we get the gospel wrong. You've heard me say this probably before, but let me say it one more time. Oftentimes we think about the gospel as inviting God to be a part of our lives. I'm going to invite Jesus to come into my heart. I'm going to invite Jesus to, to come and be a part of my life. You know, when we pick up on the gospel, as the gospel is presented, as Paul talks about it, as Peter talks about it, as John talks about it, we begin to see something a bit more dynamic. That the gospel is not so much asking Jesus to be a part of my life, as much as it is Jesus inviting you and me to be a part of his life what he's doing in the world and participating in his mission in the world. That's what it means to, 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 to be a part of the salvation work that God is doing in Christ through the Spirit. How can we begin to pay attention to what God is doing in our own lives, what God is doing in the lives of the people around us so that we can be a part of that work, his mission in us? Now, I'll be honest with you, um, that's tough. Sometimes we're distracted. It's difficult sometimes to hone in. But let me tell you what I think God is inviting us into. 
God is inviting us more and more each and every day into the kind of relationship where we begin to listen for Him. We begin to watch for Him so that we can join Him in that which He's doing in us and in others. <clears throat> you know, oftentimes when we're going through a difficult time in life, we begin to focus on the problem, don't we? We begin to focus on what's going wrong. And very often we begin, even if it's under our breath, to come to God and say, where are you? Things aren't going the way I planned. Things aren't actually coming to fruition the way that I envisioned them. Where are you? Are you gone? Have you gone away? We can read in Matthew chapter 1 that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. We can even go to the end of the Gospel of Matthew and read that same thing again. That Jesus says for His people as we continue to engage His mission in the world. He says, I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Why do we doubt whether God is with us anymore? After what He's done in Jesus. After the giving of the Holy Spirit that resides in us as His people. In order to ongoingly and always connect us with the work of God. Why do we just assume He's gone? Some of us need to simply believe that He's there. And instead of asking what's going wrong, we need to ask a different question. <clears throat> God, what might You be doing in me in this situation? No, it's not comfortable for me. I don't like it. But what might You be doing in me? How might you be wanting to open my eyes to greater realities of your work in my life and in the lives of others so that you can begin to reshape the way I'm looking at my problem and invite me to see it the way you see it? I believe that's what God is oftentimes doing in those moments when we feel the most uncomfortable. Shelley and I went through a situation like this a number of years ago where we felt God had called us into a particular place in space and ministry, and it just did not go well. And we were mad. We were hurt. And for the longest time, we couldn't do anything but just live in that pain and that hurt. Thank God that He got our attention and He invited us to ask a different question. He was right in the midst of the situation. Right in the midst of the problem. But in order to participate in what He wanted to do in us and through us, we were going to have to reroute and say, God, what are you doing in this moment? Help us to see so that we can be a part. Because we want to go with you. That's what God is calling us to. And lastly, what is it that we see? We see a scenario... Where if we want to have this kind of intimacy with God, it's going to require that we love Him. And you know what, folks? There's no way to truly love God unless we worship Him. Truly worship Him. And not just a worship that we do here when we come together on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 10 to 10.45, but a worship that pervades all of life. One final story as Grant and the team comes back to to lead us in this time of prayer as well as in this last song together. How many of you enjoyed the LSU cleansing game? Yeah. Before you were born, there was another national championship game. Back in 1990. It was won by the Colorado Buffaloes. It's one that is indelibly imprinted upon my memory. But it wasn't so much the year of winning the national championship that I remember. It was the year before. Because what happened the year before was something like this. They had a star quarterback by the name of Sal Onnesey. Sal Onnesey was a great, great quarterback. He was going to be a great quarterback in the NFL. But right before his senior year, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Sal was going to die. Sal, once the season began, was simply a, really a skeleton of his earlier self. The team rallied around Sal and said, this year is for you. We are playing this year for your honor. There was this young quarterback, guy by the name of Darian Hagen, and, uh, and a great receiver on that team in 1989 who happened to be the roommate to Sal, honestly. And there was a situation that occurred at the end of the game. It looked like they were going to lose. Sal's up in the stands. He's rooting them on as best he can. 
Darian Hagen backs up, man. You know he's going to throw the long bomb. Sal Honest, his roommate, is running right down the sideline. Darian Hagen, beautiful, beautiful strike. Hit the receiver right in stride about five yards before moving into the end zone. Touchdown. The place goes crazy. Just like it did a couple of weeks ago when the Tigers beat the Tigers, right? Yeah. It was an amazing moment. People were going crazy. People were patting each other on the back. People were tackling each other. People were giving accolades. People were giving these kinds of signs. People were even taunting other people on the team. But eventually, the cameras panned to the receiver. And in the midst of all the noise, in the midst of all the accolades, in the, in the midst of all the paddings on the back, do you know what Sal Honesty's roommate was doing in the end zone? Everybody was trying to grab him and hug him. He simply was walking away to the back of that end zone. He looked up into the crowd and pointed to his roommate, Sal. And while all this stuff was going on around him, you saw what he was saying with his lips. This is for you. This is about you. And as I saw that, I wept. I wept this morning when I told Shelly that I was going to share it with you because in that moment, I stepped back and said, that's what it looks like to be a Christian. All kinds of things to get recognition for in this world, but there's one thing that a Christian seeks recognition for. And that is that we play to an audience of one in life. That is to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. So that when all the stuff's going on, whether it's challenges or whether it's those great times when people say that we're their greatest thing, yeah, since the best receiver of three years ago, I don't know. We are actually available to God. We're present to God. And we want our lives to truly worship and glorify Him. What if this semester we truly did begin to pay more attention? What if we began to truly seek this intimacy that God is inviting us? What if we truly began to worship in all of life? Began to see how God was at work in our lives and in the lives of others and truly begin to participate in that work? When we do, when we do, that intimacy will begin to be nurtured and you won't want to go back. In what ways do you need to give yourself to the Lord as we finish out this first week in community worship together? I want to invite you just to bow your heads. And this is between you and God. Yesterday or today, has God invited you into a deeper walk with Him? Where you don't just expect God to do things for you, but you're willing, you're willing to do anything to participate in that work that He's doing in your life. Just in these next few moments, would you be honest with God? And if you've heard His voice and His invitation in these two days, would you just respond? And in a few minutes, we'll let this song be our corporate response as we finish out this week in community worship.
with our eyes this semester and let us point all of life to his kingdom in the name of the father son and holy spirit amen